I've mentioned a few times how much I love Metroidvania style games, but you know what? I've only played a couple of Metroid games and precisely zero Castlevania games. This is something I really should rectify at some point, and maybe I will in the not too distant future. Today though, I'm going to be looking at Metroid Prime, one of the two Metroid games I have played before, and it just so happens it's one of my all time favourite games. The GameCube was the first Nintendo console I actually owned, and Metroid Prime was the first game I played on it. As far as introductions to a new world of console gaming go, it's tough to think of a better one. I'd played Nintendo games before, of course, but only sporadically. I think the only Nintendo game I'd played from start to finish at that point was Banjo-Kazooie on my nephew's N64, which is also a pretty damn good game, but Metroid Prime absolutely blew me away. It sticks in my mind as possibly the best game of the generation, which is really saying something since that generation includes the PlayStation 2 and original Xbox, not to mention the drastically underrated Dreamcast. But how has it held up over the last decade and a half and a bit? Let's find out. Before the game even starts, I have to say I love the title screen, both the way it looks and especially the way it sounds. The music is great and lives on strong in my memory, but not quite as strong as that scratchy, squeaky electric noise in the background. I don't know what it is, but it makes me think of what the firing of synapses would sound like, if you could hear it, which fits in pretty well with the imagery. There's a brief narrated intro, basically talking about how cosmically legendary Samus Aran is. I don't know much about Metroid lore, and I don't think you really need to in order to appreciate this game. The narrative elements are light, but quite interesting, and you don't need to know much about the other games to appreciate them. For instance, I had no idea until much later that this game is set after the first Metroid game on the NES, but before Super Metroid on the SNES, and my ignorance had no impact on my enjoyment. True to classic Metroidvania convention, the opening section of gameplay is a tutorial of sorts in which you have access to all of Samus's weapons and gadgets. If you know much about those Metroidvania conventions, you probably know at this point that you're not going to retain that access for long. I, on the other hand, did not know that, not when I first played the game anyway. This first section also gives you a chance to get used to the controls, and for me at least they definitely took some getting used to. And they probably took even more getting used to now, in 2020, than when I first played the game over 15 years ago. Now I've had decades worth of experience with conventional first person shooters, and despite appearances, Metroid Prime is not a conventional first person shooter. In fact, it's not really a first person shooter at all. I've heard it called a first person platformer, and I think that's a really good way to categorise it. Regardless of the fact that you've got a stonking great gun occupying the bottom left of the screen, the game focuses far more on exploration and navigation than it does on combat. That's not to say combat isn't an important part of the game. You'll certainly need to blast, electrocute, shatter and disintegrate a large variety of enemies. But the combat plays out quite differently to an actual FPS. The GameCube controller has only one analogue stick, so that one stick needs to handle both movement and aiming. Holding the right trigger swaps it from movement to aiming, so your character will be locked in place while you find your target. Once it's in your sights, you can press the left trigger to lock onto that target, so you'll keep aiming at it once you release the right trigger and start moving around again. When that target dies or otherwise stops being a priority, you'll need to hold down the right trigger again to find your next target. It sounds like a clumsy control scheme, and it kind of is at first. Coupled with Samus's relatively slow movement and turning speed, Metroid Prime may seem sluggish and hard to handle. But with a small amount of perseverance, that impression will quickly go away. With a bit of practice, you will very quickly be snapping from one target to the next with barely a pause, and while player movement is undeniably not fast, the whole game is balanced around that fact. Once you've got your head around the game's minor quirks, it becomes an absolute joy to move through, most of the time. But I have to admit that, even after playing Metroid Prime for hours, every time I loaded it up my thumb went to the right analogue stick in an attempt to look around, like you would in any standard console FPS. And yes, I'm using an Xbox controller to play this time around, because I'm using an emulator. But I do still have my original copy of the game at hand, so I believe it's legitimate. Also, I promise I didn't use save states or any other dubious forms of assistance in this playthrough. The fact is, I didn't need to. 
This is not a difficult game, and that's me saying that, so you know it must be pretty easy. Anyway, there are other key features that this opening section teaches you about. You can charge up your weapon to do more damage, and occasionally to clear away debris and other obstacles. You have missiles, which are good for taking down turrets. You can enter morph ball form and gain access to additional areas through small ducts and other hidden areas with low clearance. Then there's the scan visor, which lets you lock onto scannable objects to find out extra information about them. This is helpful for acquiring tips on how to defeat certain enemies, but its main purpose is really world building. Scanning objects and alien writing throughout the game reveals little tidbits of information and history. It's a form of narrative that works really well for this sort of game. It doesn't slow down the pace, which is already a lot less than frenetic, but there's a lot of interesting backstory there for the people who care to seek it out. The boss of this first area is simple. It's really just a test to make sure you know how to lock on and dodge, which is achieved by pressing the jump button and a direction while locked onto a target. It dies in short order, and then you're presented with a time limit to escape the exploding ship. In the course of this escape, you get your first glimpse of Ridley. Now, like I say, this was the first Metroid game I played, but even I was aware of Ridley as Samus's nemesis. Although I still tend to think of him as female, because for ages I thought his name was Ripley, which made me think of the character from the Alien movies, when I guess I should have been thinking of the director of Alien instead. Of course you manage to escape, but not before a relatively innocuous explosion disables most of Samus's abilities. No more morph ball, no more missiles, no more charging up your weapon. You'd think her gadgets would be made of sterner stuff. But hey, this is a core Metroidvania element, I can't be mad. In any case, Samus tracks Ridley to the surface of planet Talon 4, and so the game truly begins. It starts by presenting you with the other key element of Metroidvania's non-linearity. There are several ways out of this landing area. Which one should you take? And where are you trying to get to anyway? Well, the only way to find out is through exploration. And this is something that Metroid Prime does better than just about any other game. The world is designed in such a way that it reveals its secrets slowly but steadily, and lets the player know that there are always more areas and hidden depths waiting to be uncovered in the minutes and hours ahead. Almost every room you enter will contain another door you can't open yet, or a barrier you cannot yet destroy, or a power-up that sits just out of reach. And sometimes those barriers will remain intact and the doors will remain unopened for a long, long time. In one of the first rooms you can get to, there's a door that requires an item you only get in the last couple of hours of the game. It's tantalising, but in a good way. One tip for new players though, when you see one of those obstacles that you can't yet overcome, make a note of its location. Seriously, use the ancient technologies of pen and paper if you have to. It makes it a damn sight easier when you want to backtrack and pick up all the stuff you've missed. Of course, I'm an idiot, so I didn't bother to follow my own advice. The first main area you come to after the lush green of your landing site is the Chozo Ruins, ancient and abandoned home of the Chozo, the long-dead natives of this planet. And I honestly think this place looks good. It's dry, dusty and atmospheric, and there's a level of detail here that was hugely impressive for its day. Even today, I'd say this game holds up really well. Great care was obviously taken in the construction of these environments, and also in the use of colour and lighting. Everything has a consistent polished look to it that transcends the GameCube's relatively limited hardware. Seriously, I was astonished by these graphics the first time I saw them, but I was just as astonished by how easy they are on the eye even today. And it's not just the visuals that are top notch. The audio is also pretty damn easy on the ear. For the most part the music sits in the background, subdued and moody, only coming to the fore at moments of high action. It's not the sort of music I personally would seek out just to listen to, but its contribution to the overall atmosphere is massive. Even more important, in my opinion, are the sound effects. Each enemy has a distinct and evocative way of announcing their presence, from the hostile drone of the wasps to the genuinely spine-chilling cries of the ghosts that rise up later in the game. 
But most important of all are the sounds made by those things which are not designed to harm Samus, but to help her. Save stations emit a distinctive electronic hum, which, combined with the special music that plays when you approach them, have become in my mind the overall equivalent of a safe space. This game can get rather tense at times, as the atmosphere becomes more oppressive and the world more dangerous, but that sound never fails to ease my heart rate a little. And then there's the sound you hear whenever you're close to a power-up, such as the ones that increase your health pool or the number of missiles you can carry. This sound, a soft rising purr, is something you'll hear often and it will always capture your attention. Quite often you'll find that you can't actually get to the power-up, so you'll make a mental note to come back later, or, if you're smarter than I am, an actual real note on paper, or at least something more reliable than my feeble brain. Before long you'll get to the first boss, although calling it a boss might be a bit of an overstatement. You just need to fend off circling wasps as you blast away at an ancient contraption until it gives up its treasure, which is your first major upgrade in the game, the missile launcher. Just why there was a working replacement for your missile launcher in these alien ruins is a question best left unasked. Now you can blast open certain doors that had been impassable, and also destroy some obstacles that are particularly vulnerable to explosives. And so, the cycle begins in earnest. Track down an item, use that item to access new areas, search those areas for the next item you'll need to access even more areas, and so on. This cycle is at the core of Metroid Prime, and it's what you'll be doing for the next 10 hours or so. You've got a rather nifty map to help you in your quest. A lot of games even today struggle to present the player with a readable 3D map, but this game does a reasonably good job. You can scan, pan and rotate, making navigation quite a bit more simple. There's also a hint system, which is a somewhat more questionable inclusion. I'm not entirely sure how it works or what triggers it, Possibly it just happens if the game thinks you're wandering aimlessly, but you often get a pop-up alerting you to seismic activity or increased radiation or some such thing. When you open your map, you'll be directed to a specific room somewhere in the world, and you'll know for sure that this is where you need to head to next. I'm still undecided as to whether this is a good thing. On the one hand, it means you'll never be wandering aimlessly for too long. On the other hand, wandering aimlessly is no bad thing in a Metroidvania game and the sense of exploration is diminished somewhat if you're being given a specific location to aim for. Ultimately, they don't have a huge impact on the gameplay. Knowing where to go is never as important as figuring out how to get there. Plus, you can actually turn them off in the options menu, which is something I didn't realise on my first playthrough. I guess the only thing I'd change is to have them turned off by default. With the missile upgrade in hand, it's only a very small journey to the next upgrade, and it's an important one, the Morph Ball. This not only allows you to move through small spaces, it's also a form of movement unto itself. It allows you to roll around with a good bit more agility and speed than just walking, especially once you unlock the boost upgrade later on. And then it's down this elevator to Magmore Caverns where... Scorching heat will kill you rather quickly. So, no, back up the elevator. Okay, so maybe it's onto the crashed frigate, where you get a look at space pirates for the first time since you landed on the planet. These ones have jetpacks, but they don't seem to want to fight you. Yet. There's also a broken crate covered in a strange material known as Phazon, a substance you'll be encountering in much greater quantities later on. Apart from that though, there's no way forward here. So, okay, how about this temple, just near your landing site? Here you learn about the 12 artifacts that, when brought together at this spot, will unlock the way to, well, something rather horrific that's been contained here by the Chozo. The written records are ominous, but non-specific, something about a great poison. Doesn't seem like the best thing for me to be opening up, but hey, 12 items to find and collect? I'm down for that. That's a long-term goal. Even the short-term goal takes me a while, but eventually I track down the next major upgrade, the Charge Beam. Hey, this is good progress. I'm already well on my way to getting back all the gadgets that were damaged at the start of the game. All I need is the grapple beam. How long could that take? Well, the answer to that is quite a while. 
There's another quasi-boss up next, a flamethrower type thing accompanied by a horde of angry and flammable wasps. Not too much of a challenge. With that out of the way, you can get the Morph Ball Bomb upgrade. As the name suggests, this allows you to lay bombs while in Morph Ball mode, which has limited combat applications but significant navigation and mobility applications. The bombs can destroy certain obstacles, and they can also serve as a sort of jump pad, launching you a short distance into the air in Morph Ball form, thus allowing access to yet more areas. Furthermore, if you chain these bombs together with just the right timing, you can perform a double jump, allowing you to access some of the game's juiciest secrets. Eventually, after getting stuck in this room for freaking ages because I failed to realise you need to activate all of the four symbols without actually leaving the room, I arrive at the game's first proper boss. Like many of Nintendo's best bosses, this one has several phases, plus a trick you'll need to figure out. In this case, you need to shoot at the mirrors until they're no longer reflecting light onto the boss, whereupon it will collapse to the ground and retract the thorny vines that are protecting the tunnel leading towards the centre of the room. Use the Morph Ball to enter the tunnel and drop a bomb at its feet, or roots, and it'll take damage. This needs to be done four times though, and every time you deal damage an extra mirror will become active. With all four active, it becomes kind of tough to deactivate them all, on account of the boss reactivating them at regular intervals. But if you distract it with weapons fire and use the Morph Ball to zip around the room more quickly, it can be done without too many problems. When it's dead, you get a suit upgrade that allows you to withstand areas of high heat. Hey, I know where to find them. So it's back to Magmore Caverns. It's definitely rather warm in this place. I love this condensation effect on your visor when you walk through steam. I also love the music in this area. And in a bit of game design that I particularly admire, the music serves a practical purpose. The timing for laying bombs in for the Morph Ball double jump can be tricky, but if you synchronise it to the dry percussive beat in the music here, you'll get it every time. It's a nice touch. Actually, it turns out you're really just passing through the caverns, for now at least. You very quickly find yourself in colder climes, in the icy Fendrana drifts, complete with another excellent bit of background music. And you won't necessarily spend much time here either. The game is really opening up now, and you'll find yourself heading back and forth through all the different areas, uncovering new and unexpected pathways that link them together. For now, you just need to track down the aforementioned Morph Ball Boost Upgrade, which allows you to hold down the B button to charge up a burst of speed. This is good for mobility, but more importantly it allows you to use certain parts of the terrain as something similar to a skateboarder's halfpipe, rolling up and down, building momentum until you can reach previously unreachable heights. You can reach even more unreachable heights with the next upgrade, the Space Jump Boots. This upgrade, cunningly located about 5 meters from your landing site, enables you to do a double jump, which is as useful as you might imagine in a game that's largely about jumping from one platform to another. It opens up a whole heap of newly accessible areas, so many in fact that this is where I start getting rather lost on a regular basis. But the game is well designed enough that I still didn't feel any frustration. It helps that even if you find yourself going completely the wrong way as far as getting to your next main objective is concerned, there's still a very good chance you'll come across a health or missile upgrade that wasn't obtainable before, but which is now reachable thanks to the morph ball or the double jump or whatever. These upgrades are spaced out well enough and hidden with sufficient cunning to ensure that exploration rarely goes unrewarded. And the health upgrades in particular are genuinely satisfying to find, as they represent a significant boost to your survivability. Not that that's a huge issue at this point, even for someone as doddery as me. The next boss, a giant frost beast with crystals on its back that absorb most weapon attacks, is kind of a pain, but not a huge hindrance. When it's out of the way, you get your hands on the first new weapon type, the Wave Beam. This is an electric weapon that can stun some enemies, but like just about every item in this game, its main usefulness lies in the fact that it allows you to access new areas, as a blast from this weapon will open purple doors. 
That said, the wave beam does also represent an upgrade to your offensive capabilities, which is timely because the space pirates are becoming more of a threat as you find yourself venturing further and further into the infrastructure they've set up on this planet. They're more agile and aggressive than any enemy you've faced up to this point, and you'll come across situations where they must be killed before the doors will unlock. By this point you should be pretty comfortable with the unconventional controls, so these space pirates are a welcome step up in the overall intensity of the game. And I think this is something else that Metroid Prime does really well. The learning curve is gentle and the game never gets very difficult, but it does do a good job of keeping you on your toes and introducing new elements at just the right rate to stop you getting bored. The next new element is, well, it's an important one. Even I, in my ignorance, knew that much because it's in the title of the damn game. It's the Metroid, a jellyfish-like floating alien creature that lunges towards you, trying to latch on and suck the life from your veins. This soul specimen isn't much of a threat, but there are sure to be others lurking in the depths. Not long after that you'll acquire the next major upgrade, and this is something I had strong memories of. It's the Thermal Visor, which allows you to basically see in infrared. I found the visual effect of this visor really awesome when I first played the game, and it's another graphical element that I honestly think has stood the test of time. It's remarkably effective in the way that it highlights enemies, but also obscures your perception of the physical world around you, so that you're not always sure if an enemy is behind cover or out in the open. Plus, it's genuinely creepy to go into a dark room, switch to the thermal visor, and see the space pirates clinging to the ceiling like malevolent spiders waiting to strike. It reminds me of the dark levels of Echo the Dolphin where you had to use your sonar to light the way, and actually there's quite a lot about Metroid Prime that reminds me of Echo. Obviously the gameplay is very different, but the atmosphere and overall feel of the game is very similar indeed, to my mind at least. I feel the same kind of awe and melancholy wonder traversing the long dead ruins and icy wastelands of Metroid Prime as I did with Echo, and the undercurrent of tension and ever-present threat is very similar. The remarkable graphics that still look good today, the evocative music and sound effects, the precise flowing movement that takes a little getting used to, yep, in many ways the two games are very alike. They're also both simply fantastic games. Anyway, the next hurdle in my path is Thardis, a sentient conglomeration of snow, ice and stone. The boss requires you to switch between visors, as his weak points can only be targeted with the thermal visor active, but he also does an attack that overloads the thermal visor sensors. He also has an ice attack that freezes you if it hits, and he periodically curls up into a ball and rolls around the arena, prompting you to do the same. It's a testament to how easy this game is that even though I manage to get hit by just about every attack he throws my way, I still have high health. Well, okay, I still have quite a lot of health. Uh, okay, I still have some health. Well, there it is, my first death. And it's genuinely embarrassing. I'm terrible at games, but even by my standards that was not a tough boss fight, all of its attacks are easy to avoid. And I managed to avoid almost none of them. Sigh. The next attempt goes better. I take the boss down with more than three quarters of my health remaining, in little more than half the time it took me to die on the last attempt. I may be old, I may be doddering, but I'm still capable of learning. Slowly. The reward for victory is the Spider Ball upgrade, which allows you to stick magnetically to certain surfaces while in Morph Ball form. Can you possibly use your razor sharp wits to guess what this means? Yep, a bunch of new areas are now accessible. Remember those ghosts I mentioned a while back? Time for them to make an appearance. They're the vengeful spirits of the Chozo, and they're kind of a pain, with their ability to disappear and reappear at random, and their immunity to most weapons. Speaking of weapons, you get another new one shortly thereafter. This is the Ice Beam, which is highly effective against many of the weaker enemies, as one charge burst is enough to freeze them, after which a single missile will completely shatter them. This is particularly useful against Metroids, which have a vulnerability to cold. And then, well, 
Then I spend another chunk of time with some more aimless wandering. Not because I'm lost, honest. Well, maybe a little lost. Eventually I happen upon the item I need, the gravity boots. These allow you to move more freely underwater, which really has a lot more to do with the viscosity of the water than it does with gravity, doesn't it? I guess viscosity boots just didn't sound as cool. In any case, this is a welcome upgrade, because prior to this moving underwater has been a real annoyance. Now I can pass through the submerged sections of the crashed frigate, and I get to this place. There doesn't actually seem to be anything I can do here, so I leave. Big mistake. I really should have looked a bit harder and found the way to open the iron bars above. This opens a shortcut that would have saved me a hell of a lot of backtracking later on. Oh well, my mistake, my loss. Instead, I turn around and head directly into the Phazon Mines, the last of the major environments you'll discover. And now the space pirates are really putting up a tough defense. You start encountering enemies who, according to your scanner, have reverse engineered your weapons technology and are now using it against you. Apparently this uh, also makes them immune to other weapons, but vulnerable to the one that they're using. What this boils down to is you now have to switch weapons to match the color of your opponents. It doesn't end up making a huge difference, but it does give you a reason to vary your weapon usage. Another even more threatening enemy, the Elite Pirate, soon makes an appearance. Well, it looks more threatening, it's a lot bigger for sure, but it turns out to be a bit of a pushover. Just wait until it lowers its shield, then blast it with a super missile. Then it immediately raises its shield again, so just re repeat the process. It'll be dead in seconds. Oh yeah, the super missile, I haven't mentioned that yet. Basically, all the weapon types have an upgrade that does something different. The wave beam fires a continuous stream of electricity, the ice beam fires a wide range cone of ice, and the basic blaster fires a super missile, essentially identical to the basic missile but a lot stronger. All of these attacks use up a significant amount of your missile stockpile, and honestly I very rarely use any of them other than the super missile. And even that I mostly save for these elite pirates. There is one other special weapon of sorts, and it's the next upgrade I acquire. This is the Power Bomb, an upgrade for the Morph Ball that creates a large and devastatingly powerful explosion. It will obliterate just about any enemy caught in its blast, but once again its main purpose is opening up new areas, as it can also destroy the most resilient of obstacles. Now, this is the point where you could almost argue that the backtracking gets a little too much. Much as I find the game world appealing, I was starting to get a little sick of trudging back and forth through the mines and the caverns and Fendrana drifts and the Chozo ruins. I'm not sure it's a real problem, and I have to admit I brought a good deal of the frustration on myself by missing that shortcut I mentioned before. But if Metroid Prime was a modern game, I suspect they might have included the ability to teleport between save points. Would that have been a good thing? I'm honestly not sure. It would have reduced some of the frustration, but the frustration isn't really all that high anyway, and something would have been lost if the ability to teleport had been introduced. It would have made the game world feel smaller, I feel. In any case, it takes me quite some time to track down the next upgrade, but it's worth the wait. This is the X-ray visor. I love the visual effect of the thermal visor, but I think this is even better. It really gives you the sense that you're seeing the world differently, that you're perceiving things that mortal eyes cannot. And this is precisely what it does. With this visor equipped, the ghosts can no longer make themselves invisible, and you can track them as they zoom around, which is pretty damn helpful. Furthermore, you can see through some walls that hide secrets, and also find secret platforms that are hidden from normal sight. There aren't many of these, but when you see one looming out of the darkness where before there was nothing, it's rather awe-inspiring. I also absolutely love the way you can see the bones in Samus's arm when she raises it to shield her face. I'm not too far off acquiring all the essential upgrades by now, and actually I'm not doing too bad with finding the inessential upgrades too. There are only three health upgrades left, and I've got enough missile upgrades to not have to worry too much about running out. Anyway, the next major upgrade is the Grapple Beam, which means Samus is finally back to where she was at the start of the game, with the added bonus of new visors and weapons. And speaking of new weapons, the penultimate essential upgrade is the Plasma Beam. It's the most potent weapon by far, capable of incinerating most foes in short order. Getting it is kind of a challenge though. Activating these giant machines reveals a vast network of spider tracks, 
infested with wandering bugs that will knock you off if you touch them. But, you know, it's not that tough. Nothing in this game is. That said, after I take some more time to wander around and track down some more power-ups I missed, it's time to face a boss that did actually make me sweat a little. It didn't manage to kill me, but it definitely came close. This is the Amiga Pirate, a phazon infused monstrosity who has been hinted at in many of the pirate logs I've come across. The boss itself wouldn't be too much of a threat, you just need to shoot its various weak points until it turns invisible and moves to a phazon puddle to recuperate, but when it does so a bunch of smaller pirates appear, and they really demand your attention. It doesn't help that I manage to walk into every single phazon puddle at least a dozen times each, and while they heal the Amiga Pirate, they're not quite so healthy for you. I get down to my last health bar, but I just managed to finish him off. Whereupon he falls right on top of you, covering you in Phazon. In true superhero fashion though, somehow this doesn't kill you, but instead grants you immunity from Phazon radiation. And that's the last upgrade you need. Every area in the game is now open to you, nowhere is blocked off. Well, except for the very last area, but that's what I'll be tending to next. The next step is finding all of the 12 artifacts that will open the way to the final boss. If you've been thorough, it's possible you'll already have them all, well, except for the final one, which requires the phase-on immunity you just got from the Amiga Pirate and is only a couple of minutes away in any case. I haven't been thorough though, so it's time for one last trip around the world hunting down the ones I'm missing. Which isn't as hard as it might sound. Scanning the statues in the temple gives you clues as to their location, including one highlighted word that essentially gives you the name of the specific room you need to go to. And once you're there, it's usually just a matter of solving a very simple puzzle, or finding a slightly hidden secret passage. I don't think it's a bad idea to save this task for last. It's not maximally efficient, but it does give you a final opportunity to search for any optional upgrades you might have missed. Plus, I kind of consider it to be a pilgrimage to a game world that I've truly enjoyed being a part of for the last dozen hours or so. Even though I've occasionally gotten frustrated by the backtracking, I don't mind having one last look around, especially since the world is fully unveiled and I know precisely where I'm going. With all 12 artifacts in my possession, it's time to head back to the temple, and into one of the most memorable boss fights in gaming history. Yes, it's time to finally face off against your arch-nemesis Ridley, or as is known in this incarnation, Meta Ridley. I just love the design of this boss. He is genuinely quite menacing, and there's a certain intensity to the way he swoops around, launching missiles and lasers, then flying into the distance only to zoom back in a ferocious bombing run. And he's even more menacing when he stomps down to earth. All of a sudden he's right in your face, and that tooth-filled maw fills half the screen. He'll swipe at you with claws and tail, while those demonic glowing eyes pierce your soul. And yet, wow, this fight is a hell of a lot easier than I remember. I guess I was remembering how intimidating it looked rather than how easy it was to avoid taking damage. Meta Ridley is one of the most threatening bosses I've ever fought, especially for the time, but once you learn when to jump and when to dodge, he's about as dangerous as a little kitty cat. I finish him off with not much more than a quarter of my health gone, and even that's only because I got too lazy to dodge properly by the end. But hey, you know me, I'm not going to object too much to an easy boss, and I still think it's an absolutely amazing boss fight, just because of the audio and visual intensity of it all. There are a few bosses that are quite so scary when they scream directly into your face. With him down, there's only one small area left, and... Impact Crater. Okay, that startled me. Why on earth does this zone get a spoken intro when there hasn't been a human voice in the game since the introductory narration? It seems bizarrely out of place. And then there's this room. They saved possibly the most annoying room in the game until right before the final boss. The Metroids here split into two when you attack them, and like the space pirates from earlier, they have random immunities to all but one of your weapons. So if you try to fight them, you end up switching back and forth, trying to target the one you can actually hurt, while the others get in your way and basically make your life painful. Plus, they seem to respawn almost as fast as you can kill them. I ended up just ignoring them and racing towards the exit, even though they're extremely good at knocking you off the small platforms you have to jump on. But okay, once that's done, it's clear sailing to the final boss, the eponymous Metroid Prime. And it's not a bad final boss, but I do think it's a bit of a letdown after Meta Ridley. 
It's definitely a lot harder though. It still doesn't manage to kill me, but it comes a damn sight closer. It's a multi-phase fight with two main stages. In the first stage, the boss takes the form of a giant spider, which switches colours at will, forcing you to switch to the matching weapon if you want to do any damage, which you presumably do. It has multiple attacks, the most dangerous of which is a large beam that matches its current colour. It does large amounts of damage and is relatively tricky to dodge, at least for someone with my reflexes. The boss also charges from one end of the room to the other, requiring you to activate Morph Ball form and use the furrows in the ground to avoid taking damage. When you've done enough damage to the boss, it jumps down to a lower level, and of course you follow. Eventually the boss starts periodically releasing floating orbs of energy that move slowly towards you. They serve as a minor distraction, but also as a source of health for you, as they occasionally drop healing orbs when they die. Only occasionally, though. This first stage is relatively lengthy, but eventually you'll move on to the second stage, which doesn't last as long, but is even more dangerous. The boss has cast off its spider-like armor and now flies around in its true form, which is something like a floating electric squid. You can't actually hurt it most of the time, you just need to focus on avoiding its attacks, which isn't difficult. After a little while though, it'll spawn a pool of Phazon along with a few of those irritating randomly immune metroids, and it's those little bastards that are the biggest threat in this phase. The boss, meanwhile, randomly changes its form so that it's only visible through either the X-ray, thermal, or standard battle visor. You need to go and stand in the Phazon pool, which overcharges your weapon, and now you can finally do some damage to the boss, assuming you've figured out which visor you need to be using, and that the Metroids don't knock you out of the pool. The Morph Ball's power bomb is incredibly useful here, as one blast can destroy all of the Metroids at once. Ammo is limited though, and honestly this one section of this one fight makes it totally worthwhile to hunt down the three power bomb ammo capacity upgrades. Bit too late to worry about that if you haven't already done it though. Unfortunately, I did. It really is fortunate actually. I suspect if I'd had only one less power bomb, I wouldn't have survived. As it is though, in the end I have just enough health to ignore the Metroids and deliver the death blow. And that's it, the game is done. As it lays dying, Metroid Prime latches onto Samus and seems to absorb something that may or may not be a hint to the events of the sequel. And actually, if you get 100% of the items, you get a secret ending that's more than just a hint. I didn't do that though. Simply finishing the game also unlocks hard mode, which I haven't tried, but which I imagine people with more skill than me, i.e. almost everyone, would be grateful for. I died a total of two times in this playthrough, once on that ice and stone boss, and once a bit later when I got lazy and just started running past enemies rather than fighting them, and misjudged how far I had to go to make it back to a save point. So yeah, definitely not a difficult game on the first playthrough at least. That is to say, the combat isn't difficult. There is a certain amount of challenge in Metroid Prime, but it comes mainly from navigating through the world and just figuring out how to get to where you need to be. And that's the sort of challenge even I can relish, especially when the game world is as appealing, evocative, and finely crafted as it is in this game. So, is Metroid Prime as good as I remember? Am I still prepared to call it possibly the best game of its generation? Well, yeah, I actually am. I'm not going to say it's the best, my opinion on that changes on a day-by-day -day basis, or even an hour-by-hour -hour basis, but it's definitely up there. For me, Metroid Prime is the epitome of Nintendo products in that it's a game which is not afraid to just be a game. Every part of it was crafted with the player in mind, and with the intention of creating a world and an experience that would be enjoyable and compelling. It's not trying to be cinematic, it's not trying to tell a deep and meaningful story. There is actually a good amount of story to be found within the game, but it's always in the background, it never impinges on the gameplay. Likewise, the environment serves the gameplay, not the other way around. Too many game designers these days seem to start with the goal of creating realistic, finely honed environments and then work the gameplay around them. Metroid Prime did the opposite. The temples and ice flows and lava caverns were first and foremost designed to be fun and satisfying to explore. Why are there missile upgrades scattered throughout an ancient alien ruin? It doesn't matter. What matters is that they are a compelling reason to explore. The fact that the environments have also been bestowed with great detail and a high level of atmosphere is an added bonus, and a very significant one. 
The attention to detail really is remarkable. There are interesting little things everywhere that you might not even notice at first. One small element I particularly like but couldn't find a place to talk about is the way you can sometimes see Samus's eyes reflected in the glass of her visor when there's a bright explosion on screen. It's subtle but highly effective, to the point I was genuinely startled at times to see those ghostly reflected eyes peering back at me. So yeah, Metroid Prime was an absolute joy to revisit and I hope you've got just a little bit of enjoyment from watching me experience it all again. If you have, please consider liking this video or even subscribing. Stuff like that makes a huge difference to a small channel like me. Until next time though, get off my lawn.